Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to prepare the thing and bring it in. So we're gonna st I'm not going to start coding these things anymore. You know exactly what a module is and how it works and all those good stuff. Uh, to be able to understand uh, uh, the concept of constructors, structures, and things like that, I'm not going to create a complicated uh, uh, class with uh, dynamic memory allocation and things like that. So what I'm going to give you as examples today, they are not going to... Uh, like, you need to have constructors and destructors created for something, for a purpose. Um, those purpose, those reasons don't exist here, okay? The, what I'm creating probably doesn't need any of these, but I'm just giving you examples of it to see how it works. So we learn the syntax, we understand what a constructor is, how is it called, how it's used, and all those things, and then after that we're going to apply it on a real thing that uh, these things are actually needed in. So that's why I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call it a container, just uh, as an example. So uh, uh, the class container that we create, the class container, uh, class container represents a container. It has uh, 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 some kind of a value in it, value of things that it has, or va uh, values values, okay? And it has a maximum capacity like any, any uh, compiler, uh, any, any container, which means uh, you're going to say that's, I don't know, 300 milliliters, that's 200 milliliters max, this is 500 milliliters, but that has 50 milliliters in it, this has, or with, we can have a box of 24, uh, I don't know, bottles of beer, and it only has 10 beers in it but you cannot go more than 24. That's what it is. So it has, it has a capacity and it has an actual value inside the container. That's what we're going to work on. Very simple, straightforward, okay? Down to this point when we create the class, the classes that we create, we set stuff in it to make sure that when we are setting something, uh, uh, we, we, we create a method called set to make sure that if we are setting the contents of the container to something, those values are supervised. We just don't create it. And uh, the values that are set are, are actually done in a proper way. So to be able to see uh, uh, yeah, that's right. So what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to create a set function. So void set, and set accepts an, an integer that is the value that I'm going to set the container with. Uh, so if it's only one set with one value, I'm going to set the value and not the capacity. Okay? Or I can have another set that can set the value and capacity. Are we okay with this? Two different sets to do whatever I want to do. So let's just set it up and see what happens. So I'm going to bring in the same namespace. Definitely, definitely this is a container method. This one too. And this one too. Okay. Now, where did this go from? So, essentially, when I am setting uh, a container to a value, all I'm doing is let me just split it in two. Is, can you read this at the back of the room? It's too small. Should I make it bigger or are we okay? Is it good now? Are we okay? All right. So, uh, I said we supervise. So what happens is that 
Um, if I am setting the value, so what I need to do over here is to say, okay, I am setting the value. So if I am setting the value, oh, um, I'm going to say uh, it's a container. The value cannot go negative, right? So in here, I'm going to say if uh, the value that I'm receiving is greater than or equal to zero, um, and the value that I'm receiving is less than or equal to capacity, right? That's the maximum capacity that it has. It cannot be more than that. So I'll put that one over there. Capacity. Okay. And if that's the case, then I'm going to set the value to the value that is coming in. Otherwise, what do I do? Empty state, right? So we set it to empty. So when we are writing the code, I'm like, okay, I'm going to set it to an empty state. Sure, let's do it. So I don't have any function for it. I'll imagine we have one. Easy. So I'm going to say set to, to safe empty state. Done. Okay? Uh, I'm going to write it later, but I know it's there. Or if, if you don't want to implement it now, at least put the at least put the uh, uh, prototype in here. So void safe empty state just to be there. So I can write my code without wiggly thingy. Yes. Yeah, I can. I can definitely do that. But the, what's the problem with that? First of all, this is not the only place that I'm going to set it to a safe, empty state. I'm going to set it in many different places, right? In many different scenarios. But let's say this is the only case. This is actually a good point. The reason that I'm making a function right now, because all we, know, we all know when I read it, when I do stuff, things, when I do things with this thing, I have to be able to set it in an empty state in other scenarios if I want to, right? Um, but what if I only have to do it right over here and nowhere else? Is it better to create a method for it or just set it directly? And why? Anybody? Should I choose my victims? You look like that person who wants to answer the question. <laughs> oh, ah, yes, I know. It's better to create a method for it that way. It's labeled so you know what you're doing when you come back to. Yeah, see, that's actually explicit. I, I, I can just stand over here and you come and lecture. That's exactly what it is. But it is. If I just put it over there, you know you're not going to comment it, right? Nobody comments their code. You don't. Okay? You, you just don't. Just go take a look at all the, like, go to any open source project and take a look at their code. They they comment some, but not. If Five years from now, you are coming and taking a look at this one because something went wrong. All you see over there is value is equal to minus one. How do you know what the devil that means? It's five years past. You don't even know what the devil is a container. What does it do? So always try to name uh, your actions under some kind of a method if that has a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, you're absolutely right. We don't do it. But in this case, I am. Now, if I want to set it with your capacity, now I have to actually set it properly. Uh, and the capacity, maximum capacity, changes over here. So this capacity of the container will change. So um, how do I set that? If I have two values over here, how do I set what is what? And, like, I cannot have a, like a maximum thing all the way through, right? I cannot have a maximum thing all the way through. I need to have something uh, uh, to, uh, to have a limit for that capacity that I'm having. So for that, lots of you, for some reason, in your do-it-yourselves are using defined statements, although I explicitly mention use constant values. At this moment, trust me, just use constant values and do not use 
uh, uh, define statements. Please do not laugh at your screen. That pisses me off. Okay? Unless you're right taking notes of mine, but if you are, you know who I'm talking. Like, you know who you are. I'm not going to look at you. Just, it really distracts me. And it's insulting all the way through. If you think you don't need the lecture, just don't come to class. It's, I'll be happy. No, no problem. Okay? Please. All right. All right. So, it's really distracting. Anyway, so uh, the max capacity over there that I'm putting, I'm just putting a limit for the size of the container, how big it can get. So let's say the maximum capacity that, compli the, uh, that I can actually have that I should validate for is, let's say, 1,000. So I'll put 1,000 over there. Now I can create the second set with whatever I want to be set properly. So if the value is between uh, it, this time is not m capacity because I'm actually changing the capacity. The value should be between this and that. But before doing anything, I have to make sure that the capacity itself is validated. So uh, if capacity is greater than value and capacity is less than or equal to max capacity, then do all these stuff. And again, remember, first write the code in an awful way, then fix it. I don't want to write the most efficient code right out of, out of the bat. Whatever comes to my mind, I do it, make sure it works, and then I'll go back and make it efficient. So when I'm doing it like this, I need to have this thing. So I need to have over here another else yet over here and set this to a, to a safe empty state, right? which doesn't make sense. I should have actually had it in an if statement. Shorten it later on. This is an awful code. Fix it. Yes. OK? Yes. Nothing. It's going to be garbage. It's going to fail. That's where our code fails. That's why I'm doing this lecture, to tell you why is it failing. Yeah, if it's for the first time you call that set, we're in trouble. Because you have garbage in M capacity, and you had no idea what it is. That's what we're going to go through. Yep. Are we OK down to here? And that safe, empty state, let's actually do it right now and get over this. So please fix this code for me. OK? This code works, but it's awful. OK? So first I'm saying for this one, I'm saying if capacity is greater than value that is being passed in, capacity is less than or equal to maximum capacity as rule of our business, we are good. Come in. If it's not, safe, set it to a safe, empty state. Then in here, I'm going to say if the value is greater than 0 and less than the capacity that I just set, so in this case, capacity is correct because I'm in the if statement, set the value, and then uh, I forgot to set the capacity. Set the value and capacity, which is um, capacity, set the capacity. Okay, otherwise set to a safe empty state. Now, setting to a safe empty state, um, that's easy too. So void so, um, container, set to safe empty state. And in here, I'm going to say what is an impossible value. So m value set to minus 1, right? That's an impossible thing. Any problem with that? Do I need to set m capacity to something too when I'm setting it to a safe empty state? The answer is no, never do that, OK? You just want to flag the object invalid. Have one thing and stick to it. Don't put five different conditions in there, unless there is a business logic that says it is invalid if this is minus 1 and that's positive. But if that's minus 1 and this positive, then yeah, if that's the case, sure, do it. But in our case, that's an invalid thing. Do the minimal, easiest thing that you can do for setting stuff to invalid. And of course, when I have something like this, I have to check to see if it's valid or not. Therefore, I'm going to have a Boolean is empty, is in safe is in safe, empty 
state. I was one of those who was a genuine C programmer, which is I try to shorthand all the things that I'm writing, make the names small. After seven, eight years of programming and trying to guess what the heck was that abbreviation that I created seven years ago, then I came back to this. I'm going to write my functions the best, especially now, because IntelliSense actually completes it for you, right? Uh, old days, you had to type the whole thing by ourselves. But now IntelliSense is foot giving it, like literally typing it for you. So put meaningful names so later on you understand what you're doing. So, and uh, the code that I'm writing is full of mistakes. Uh, and I'm expecting you to point to it. So Boolear container, container uh, is in safe empty state. And all it does over here, it returns m value being less than 0. Any problem down to here? This is just things that we have done down to this point from the beginning of the semester, right? And I'm going to create a display, too, to be able to show this thing. So to display it, I'm going to have, what do I do? I'm going to have uh, o stream, of course, because I want to be able to uh, reuse my uh, uh, function name. So I'm going to say o stream reference display. And it's a constant because I'm displaying. Right? And then the constant thingy that I have over here, I'm going to have o stream reference display um, container, sorry. Container uh, display const. And in here, I have to, so <clears throat> first of all, this O stream that I have, uh, yeah, I have to have O stream. So I have O stream over here in STD, so this is standing good. This one is not, so I have to have O stream at the top. So in here, I'm including O stream. So include uh, IO stream. And uh, of course, this is in the namespace STD using namespace std. And when I'm displaying over here, uh, everything's OK down to here? Is in safe empty states going to return true or false? True or false. We are in C++. Let's mention it. OK. It's true or false. But yes, it's 0 or 1. Or false or true. It's not going to show. It's going to actually, yeah. Uh, do you, did, we, did they teach you enumeration in, in IPC 144, enum? No? So, yeah. Zero, one, true, false, potato, sorry. One, zero, true, false, potatoes, potatoes. Okay, let's call it true. If you print F true with percent D, one is going to show up. If you print F false with percent D, one is going to show up. Two, a zero is going to show up. In no circumstance you can print something and it prints true, ever. It's C. C language doesn't know what's true. Okay, ever. It's just make they just made a type out of it. They renamed zero. They gave it the name false. Okay. So, are we okay? Anybody have any objection to the code I wrote? Okay. I wait. I made one mistake. What was my mistake? No, I haven't uh, done display yet. So display, I haven't, assuming that display works perfectly. What is wrong with this code? For what? Oh, I am sending. Return m value min, uh, less than zero. The conditions return truth or false. So that's beautiful. There is one mistake. Huge mistake. I haven't even taught constructor yet. Pardon me? No, I'm not, am I? No. Oh, that 
code that I've written, that's a bad, that's perfectly, it, it's perfectly sound code, but it's written, it's an ugly code. You, you can fix it. You can have a better logic code. And so, so that's, that's an awkward code, but you can fix it easily. I'm not fixing it, so you have something to do. Okay? Um, but, okay, just look at the code. I'll give you 15 seconds. No? It is a member for your container, right? Seriously? Nobody's seeing you? You already answered one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, both projectors are exactly the same. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, I mentioned many, many times you are not allowed to use using in a header file. You are not allowed to use using in a header file. Because if you use using in a header file, people who use your header file without knowing will use the entire namespace in their code. And they're going to have conflict with their classes if they don't know that. Okay? It's like one of those things that, like, you go get a cell phone plan and they're going to say it's free something like this and then you don't read the fine print over there and you see 55,000 things to, you committed to it and you're not aware of it. That's what using is. When you say using namespace STD, it means bring all the classes of STD in my code. You don't want that to happen without you knowing. Because of that, using the word using in a namespace is strictly prohibited in the C++ communities everywhere. Yes. If you have that thing on a thing, resubmit your code immediately. Okay, that's not supposed to happen. If you are in need of qualifying, qualify every single statement separately to the namespace that is in. So instead of using name, namespace std, you simply say, oh, stream is in std only and you're fine. Are we okay with this? So remember that. Never use using in a namespace, uh, in, a, in, a, in a header file. Yes? No, we didn't need iostream. If you didn't have OStream over there, including iostream was a big crime. <laughs> okay? So we don't want to do that. All right? So, and now the display thingy. So in this display, I'm going to say if uh, is in safe empty state, is if, uh, then I'm going to say over here, see out, uh, invalid, um, container object, container object. All right, I'm not going to go to new line because I, I want uh, to have the option later on. And otherwise, I'm just going to display it. So I'm going to say see out. Um, See out, and what I'm displaying, I'm displaying the value. And let's say putting a slash over here, and I'm going to show the, the capacity. All right? Question, uh, and at the end, I'm going to return see out. So doing that return see out, my display will act like C out because it's returning its reference. So I can actually print stuff into, insert stuff into this way. Okay? Why I get, I'm getting that wiggly red thingy over there. What's wrong with my code? Line 34. Container.cpp. I have a mistake. Why? What is that? The function is, function is sound. It's right over there. I have the container is in safe empty state. And I have the, uh, the function inside the class. So everything is set. Why I am getting that error message? Yes. Oh, it does know. It is only one. And it's right at line 30. So implementation is at line 30. <clears throat> Think, please. Why is that thing wiggly?
Seriously? Anyone? Any suggestion? Uh huh. That's another function. So they are not the same so function. They, they are not interconnected. No. <clears throat> so if oh, okay. so if set to empty state is called before some time, then is in safe empty state will return true, which is what we want. But that's not the reason. <clears throat> Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Why is it error over there? Analyze it for me. Somebody, tell me what's going on. Yes. It is one return statement. Well, no, I mean, like, just expecting one outcome. It's not it is only one outcome. And it's either true or false. It's one outcome, it's a condition, it could be true or false, yes. It's perfectly complete. It's, it's calling a function that returns a Boolean value. And a condition of an if statement is to be a Boolean value. Good points are coming up. It means you're thinking. I'm happy. No, because it is in the container. It knows all the functions in container. Everything's open to it. Last resort, not now. Thank you. You got 5% for your first test. Remember that. Okay. And from now on, the person who got 5% cannot answer anymore, get any 5%. So all the other people are open. Okay? So the reason that this is doing that is that I have a display that is constant, which means I am essentially dictating to display, dictating to display, telling you, you are not allowed to change your owner. And then I am calling a function that is allowed to change the owner, which breaks the rule. I did a bad design by not setting this to constant, and somebody mentioned it before. It was you. He said, she said, why didn't you set this to constant and then the subject changes, changes, and we didn't talk about it. I didn't at first because I wanted it to, be, uh, to happen. So this, ha because it's not changing anything, it just tells you what the state of the, the object is. Therefore, there is no need. So that's going to be const over there. And we're going to have const over here. And the problem is solved. Yes. Who knows? Well, it's not. You know, because you're a human being, you know the logic. It's a computer. Computer is an idiotic fool. It doesn't understand anything. Always remember, that's actually a very good point that I have to tell you. Um, it, I, I mentioned this at IPC. Anybody in my IPC 144 class? No, 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 no. <laughs> I haven't taught it for a long time, but I thought maybe. Well, anyways. Computer is dumb as a doorknob. There is absolutely no intelligence in computer. You've heard about AI, shmei, that's just piece of hee okay? It, computer is the dumbest thing. It doesn't know anything unless you tell it what to do. AI essentially means you have a computer with ginormous amount of processing, power of processing and memory, and then you teach it how to learn but still you are teaching it. And then only in the area that you are teaching it, it becomes smart, OK? We're going to be passing. I'm not going to go into philosophy, but in 10 years, computers are going to be much more smarter than us. But let's forget about that. Now, to this point, when you are writing something in here, computer has no idea what you have written in it. 
if computer knew that what you're doing over there is actually something that's not going to change the content of the thing, it would have written the program for you. <laughs> right? So unless the reason you put the const over here is to make sure that you don't do it. Not doing it doesn't enforce it. OK? So the fact that I'm not changing anything in here doesn't mean that the function is constant. I have to label it so the compiler knows it. Anyways. But what I have created over here, so essentially I can set whatever I want. So in here I can go int main. So I can actually say container. Container. C. And I can say C dot display or C dot set. C dot set. Um, to say um, 25, and I'm going to say c.display, and go to new line. And when I show this beautiful program of mine, print this beautiful program of mine three years later, four years later, five years later, and this is what I'm going to get. Invalic container object. What is invalic? I know, I'm trying to find it. All right, so essentially, I'm lucky to have this thing in a set. I'm surprised that it's in a safe empty state. Why is it? Oh, yeah, because the set that I'm doing, yeah, it's checking with M capacity. And M capacity over here, so set is not doing anything because the capacity is not something that is set, so it sets it to a safe empty state. We are lucky. If the value in capacity was something higher than this, then we were in trouble. Now, these cases, like things like container or logic that we write, crave for some kind of a procedure that can be done at the moment of creation. I should be able to state certain type, certain things to be done as the program is running to make sure that my uh, uh, Object is in a safe empty state or in any state that I want. Like a container is actually not in a safe empty state when you're getting it, right? If you get this uh, bottle of this bottle, does it come with holes in it as, as an invalid thing? No. It comes as an empty container, right? Not in a safe empty state, but in an empty state. Valid, but empty state, right? So in this case, if I, if I want when I say container C, not even set it, setting it to 25, when I display this function, when I display this container, I'm assuming that it shows me zero out of whatever the capacity is this. So zero out of 24 ounces, or 500 milligrams, or 750 milligrams. So, so it should tell me this is the container that has nothing of this amount of thing. We can do this. This is done in a procedure, again, in a procedure that you can add to your class. These procedures are not functions. 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 What does it mean? They look like a function, but they're not. You cannot call them. I'll, sh I'll explain. Yes. It doesn't. Why? So because it comes because it, what is the capacity? We didn't say it. How do you know what's the value in it? And usually garbage is usually a big negative number. But again, we don't know. If it was a positive number, if it was a positive, big positive number, then you would have, uh, the display would have something zero out of five billion. Okay. So to create this constructor, there is a rule. To be able to distinguish what a constructor is and separate it from functions, we name the constructor with the name of the class. So you essentially say constructor. And oh, container. 
So you say container, then the same name as class, as the class, and then you define it in here. But because it's not a function, well, because it's, it's not a function, you will not put any return value for it. And anything you write inside a, a constructor will get executed at the moment of creation. So it's the moment of creation that dictates when a constructor is being called, not you. You cannot manually call a constructor. A constructor is not a function. A constructor is not a function. So in here, I would say, okay, if I have a container, I want my container to be empty. And what's an empty container? The value inside the container is zero. And the capacity of the container is set to, let's say, max capacity that I have. an empty container. Now, if I run this program of mine, I will not get an error, but instead I'm going to get an empty container. Zero out of a thousand. Which makes sense, right? I have a thousand milliliter container with nothing in it. Are we okay with this? This is a little too big. Let me make it smaller. Properties. There we go. Any questions down to here? Suggestions? Objections? Okay. So a pause in recording, and let's have five minutes break. So that's how the constructor works. Constructor gets called at the moment of creation, and that's what it is. That's how it works. You can. <coughs> not only have a default, because this is called no argument constructor or default constructor. We can create a constructor that actually, we can create a constructor that actually receives values for us and resets stuff the way we want it. I can do that. How? Um, by creating a constructor that accepts uh, an argument. So if you actually say container, and say integer value over here, so I can actually pass the value to this one. Now, the bad thing that I have done over here that nobody ever mentioned why you did that is that I shouldn't have done something like this. If I wanted to do that, I should have reused my code, which is set, zero, and max capacity. So never hard code anything. Always reuse your code. Always, always reuse your code. Okay? <clears throat> so that's that. Uh, so I create the uh, constructor with one argument. So I'm going to go over here, container. And integer value. <coughs> and this one, <coughs> sorry, and this one, what I will do is set it to value and max capacity. So essentially, this constructor receives a value and sets it to whatever I want. Now I'll get in this one, and I'll go save it as 0, 1, uh, default constructor. All right, let's open the other one and close this one. So now what I can do is this. I can actually set this thing to... Uh, I don't know, 500. So by doing something like that, by setting the value of an object at the moment of creation, I am essentially asking it to call the constructor that accepts that value. And because the container of mine, this constructor, receives an integer, that's what happens. So when I actually run this program three years later, Four years later, what happens is 
it gets into this one. As soon as it wants to get executed, it jumps to the constructor that accepts an integer value. And if you look at the value that is coming in, it's 500. Then it gets the max capacity and value. Set it exactly to what it's supposed to be. And we are done. And it comes and displays it. And the display is going to be 501,000. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> this is how I called it specifically at the beginning to show you how a constructor that accepts one value works. So please appreciate this thing that I just showed you. Assignment at the moment of creation is not assignment. It's actually, what is it? Yes, it's a call to a constructor. So I could have written it like this. I could have actually said, um, instead of doing that, I could have said container C500. These two are identical. And this is not only for, uh, this is not only for uh, objects. For primitive values, it's the same. If I, for example, I want to, like if you want to display that thing five times, what do you do? You go uh, for int i set to zero, i, I set to zero, if I can type it, set to zero, i less than five, i plus plus, and Say, I'm going to just make it space separated and see out new line over here. Now, if I run this program, you know how it works. It's going to be the, the C500 is exactly the same thing and absolutely no difference. So, this is what I'm going to get, right? It's going to print it five times. But what should, but you should know is that that's equal to this. Absolutely no difference. I can do that. A call, an assignment at the moment of creation is a call to a constructor. So when you actually wrote integer i is equal to 0, you called the constructor of integer, passing it an initial value. And this happened, as you see. It's the exact same thing. No difference. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So these two are the same. And that brings us to the next thing. So what is the difference? At so what is this? Now I'm going to actually comment this and comment this one instead. Save it like that. <clears throat> Let me bring up the program again. So what happens if I did this? Will it work? Or it's going to cause an error? I have a container at left and an integer at right and an assignment in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's assigning C yeah. to 500. Can it do that? You write the code for it. That's the code for it. It gets the max value. You have the code for it. Why do you care? So that was the construct. But this one, assignment over here, it's a different story. Oh, that's what you're saying? Yeah, but, but let's run it. Let's run it, see if it's going to actually work. And surprisingly, it works perfectly. Why? For that, I'm going to teach you something new that is pretty cool, actually. So I'm going to go to that container thingy over here and add a define statement for myself. 
the finest DSD bug, I call it. Okay? And what does it do? It defines something exactly like that at the top of the thing. I'm going to use that feature and come into my container stuff, for example, in my constructor, and I'm going to write a code like this. So I'm going to say, as soon as I set it, I'm going to say, if SDDS debug is defined, this one says, if not defined, right? This one says, if SDDS debug is defined, compile this line. So see out default of the container. Container, not container. All right? And when I'm calling this constructor, I want this message to be printed. So these are debugging messages that I want to be displayed. Default at the container. I'm going to actually say two. And reuse my code, and I'm going to say display and L, new line. And in here, I'm going to put another message. I'll, I'll show you why I'm doing this. Creating a container with this value in it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if I run this program, when the constructor is called, it's going to show me a message. Okay? Any constructor that is called, it's going to show me a message. Okay? So let's try it and see what happens. When I run it, then we have to analyze and see what's going on here. So now it's going to actually show a few messages before showing that loop for me. Defaulted a container to 0, 1000. That's line number six. You follow? I want everybody's attention on this. This is the moment that you're learning something very important about C++. What is the second message over there? Creating a container with some value. Didn't I put that one in the other constructor? I did, right? I put something in the other constructor. That's the message creating a container. So the constructor with one value is called, but I didn't create anything. It's already created. I have one object. Why I have two constructors called? Think about it for a second. I created one object. Why I have two constructors? Now, in IPC144, if you wanted to drop, if you wanted to drop the decimal points of a double number, how did you do it? How? Or let's say you didn't know what casting is. How did you do it? You put it in an integer variable, right? So you say double A with some value, integer I, then you say I is set to A, and what happens? The partial parts are, are, are removed and put in, 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 in I, correct? How did it work? How did we explain this thing? We said, when compiler sees two, an assignment operator, it expects to have identical stuff around it. Two integers, two doubles, two characters, two pointers, two containers, two employees, identical values. So it can copy the memory from here to here. OK? Now, if it can't, it always tries to get the right one and convert it temporarily, which is casting, correct? to the left one. Are we okay with this? Now, compiler looks at line number seven and says, at left side, I have a container. At right side, I have 500. Can I temporarily make a nameless container out of an integer called 500? Can I do that? Do I have the tools for it? Compiler looks at your source code and sees, there you go. I have a constructor that accepts an integer value. Because I have the tool for it, 
I'm going to create a temporary nameless container with that 500. After I created that one, I'll copy the memory from that temporary thing that I did, that I've copied, and put it in C. Then I'm going to kill it because I don't need it anymore. And then it's going to print the rest of the stuff. <clears throat> OK? Now, to prove this thing, I'm going to bring another thing in. We said that we can create routines that happen and run at the beginning of program. We said that at the beginning of lifetime of an object. We have the exact same capability for the end life, of, uh, end, for the time that the, uh, an object is dying right before the moment that the object is going out of scope and it's dying, you can ask something to happen. Exactly like a constructor. It's like cleaning up after yourself. When it's exactly like having food. If you want to have dinner with your family, you set the table, you put everything, you bring the meal to the thing. That's the constructor of the table. The table is built and ready to use. Now everybody come over there, sit and eat. And now you are leaving. Right before you leave, you clean up the table and throw everything away and put the table in the status that it was. That is called a destructor. Destructor essentially is when you want to clean stuff up. In here, I have absolutely no need for it. Why? Because it's just a, a container with information inside of it. If I throw away this bottle, the water inside will go to garbage. I don't need to clean this bottle before I throw it away. It is something that contains its whatever it has. Yes, if I had a pointer in a function, in a class, and that pointer was pointing outside to something else, and I wanted to deal with that, then I needed it. But in this case, I do not. Therefore, it's for example purpose only. Okay, that's the only reason I'm using it. So, how to create a destructor? It's exactly like a constructor, no argument constructor, but <clears throat> with a tilde at the beginning. And destructors, it's just like, because somebody asked this question that I'm going to mention, but I don't even need to know, I don't even know if I should mention it. Like, we say, can we pass an argument to a constructor? Why would we want to do that? Like, constructor has one job to clean up. You don't need to pass a value to it. So, yeah, what I'm saying is that the destructor doesn't need anything to do its work. That's why constructors, destructors are always one value. They are not two. So, to create the destructor, I'll go container. It's muscle memory. Sorry, it keeps coming as const, OK? And tilde container. And I have nothing to do in here. All I'm going to do is print a message. Why do I want to print a message? Because I want to see when objects die. That's all. So what I'm going to do is simply having, a again, another debug statement to show a container with this value is dying. Now, if I run this program, and at the same time I look at main, at line C, I know I'm going to default a container to 1,000, correct? 0 and 1,000. At line 7, a temporary nameless is getting created with value 500 by, th five, uh, by 1,000. Then that value is copied into C, because now at left side I have a container, at right side I have a container. Right at that moment, between line 7 and 8, at line 7.5, at line 7.5, compiler destroys the temporary object that was created, which container with 500,000 value is dying. That's the message. Then the printout happens at line 8. OK? And then at the end of the program, C dies, which is this one. Okay? 
that's, these are called temporary nameless objects. This is t temporary nameless objects. And this is one of those, this is one of those but it works moments. Let me remove the debugging statements. And that's a beautiful thing about this. You see all these debugging statements over here? If your program works and you don't want them, all you need to do is to go to the header file and comment it. Done. You don't need to remove anything anymore. If I run the program, because that is removed, all the things that I had in comments will be ignored by compiler. And that's what it runs. Let me make my point, and I'm going to answer your question in two seconds. My point is, when you look at the output, it looks like a normal program running. But that single extra line that you put over there at line 7 costed compiler the creation of another object that wasn't needed. Therefore, your program runs twice as slow as the program that initializes that value to 500. Behind the scene, lots of garbage stuff happens that if you don't take care of it, you'll be in trouble. Yes. Because you don't, because when you want to hand it to me, you have 500 things to clean up before you give it to me. Like this, you just comment that and you're done. That's exactly my answer. Okay. I want to have debug statements everywhere because I'm trying to see how things work. Okay, I want to have a debug statement in here. I want to have a debug statement in here. I want to have a debug statement in here, correct? See out the way you said, correct? Now it's the time you want to give. Everything is working. Your debug statements are working. Everything's fine. Now you want to test it and see how does it work without a debug statement. What do you do? And this program is 500,000 lines, not 50. And you have 2,000 debugging statements, C outs in there. How do you wipe them out? How do you keep track of which one is where? You can't. But you go, essentially, the good way of doing it is even, instead of having it here, is to have something like this, actually, quite frankly. To have in your header file, add a new item. And I'm going to have over here debug.h. And I have that one over there. So what happens in my program when I want to do debugging, all I need to do over here, I'm going to include debug. Why did I do this? Why did I put that one in the header file and make, made it even more complicated? Come on. Why did I do this? It's because when you are actually doing debugging, when you are actually doing debugging, when you have 900 files, you don't know where you did that debug thingy. You don't know where you had that defined statement with debug. But when you are writing a big program, all you need to do is to include your debug header file everywhere. And then whenever you want to activate the debugging, you just go to your debug thingy and un uncomment that one. And you rerun your program, recompile and rerun your program, and all the debugging messages are going to get activated automatically. You remove it again, and all the deb debugging statements are gone. So it's just a matter of a compile. It's a beautiful thing. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Where is it? Okay, sure. You see this? This is the submitter program that submits your code. All the things, assignments that you do, 
How do they get submitted? The submit command that you write, this is the program for it. Look at its main. That's the main. Submitter s argument, that's, that's an s.run. So that's the program. If I want to debug this thing, if I want to see how it works, how can I debug it? And look at the number of files that I have over here. And every single one of them, if I look at, if I want to just to look at the code for every single one, you know how much I have to go through things? All I need to do now to go in my header files, find debug.h, and activate what I want. At the time, the name of our school was SICT. Remember? I don't know if you remember. So that's what I did. Define SICT debug, define debug email. So I have two different debugs, debugging the email statements, debugging this and that. I just uncomment that, and poof, everything goes into debug mode. I can actually test my program. That's the live ex example for it. If I didn't have that one, any bug that would come out, it would, would be, take me weeks to be able to find it. So it's a good thing to do. By the way, this is open source. You can go and find it in my repository and download the source code and see how it works. It's, I've written it with OOP244 knowledge. Okay? This thing is written with OOP244 knowledge. There is nothing extraordinary in there. I'm, 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 I, go check it out. You have, have you looked at it? No? Look at it. See? Look at it to see if, it, if you can hack it. Maybe you can hack it and make all your assignments on time. Who knows? Right? Try it. Okay, that's it. That's what I mentioned. You don't put it equal to 500. You put equal to, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. When you put something like this, compiler tries to fix your code. Therefore, compiler does this. Remember I told you, you can never call a constructor? Remember that? Compiler does that for you. When you don't mention it, when you don't mention it, it's not a call to a constructor now. It works. If I run this, it works perfectly. It will compile and work. Again, that is not a call to a constructor. That is essentially this without the name of the variable. If I did it like that, it would have been I created a container called A, right? When you take that thing out, you are creating a container that doesn't have a name. So this and this These are identical. No difference. OK? As a matter of fact, take a look at this. I'm going to say C out. And I'm going to put a line over here just for you to, sh to see what I mean. Oh, seriously, I need to learn how to type. OK. That's that. See what I'm going to do? Container 200 point display. See? At line 12, right after printing those 12 things, it's going to create a temporary nameless container out of 200, display it, go to new line, kill it, and then print this line. So if I run it, this is what you see. Uh, let me uh, activate the debug so you can actually see the, the creation and dying of the thing. So if I do like that, this is what happens. See, container with something, something. First, it creates a container, prints it, goes to new line, kills it. Now the line is drawn. Yes, I did. OK? Now, compilers, uh, constructors can be created with more than one argument, of course. I, I don't have to always have only one argument. If I want to set the capacity to, I can simply create a container. 
with integer value and capacity. Okay? Now, it works exactly like the other one. It doesn't make any difference. And then I'm going to show you a common mistake that I'm going to mention you're going to do it, and you will do it still, even if I told you that it's a mistake. So this one I'm going to put int capacity. And instead of max capacity, I'm going to pass the capacity to it. There you go. Now I have a container that accepts two values. OK? And why is it showing still this to me? Function is not found. Int, int. Oh, I have to save this, I guess. We'll find out. I don't know why it's giving me an error. Container, int, int. Looks OK to me. Yeah, sometimes just IntelliSense falls behind. Anyway, so, so now I have it. So uh, 0, 3, temporary, nameless objects, dot CPP. <coughs> So now, I can actually create a container like this, 200 and 500. Pardon me? Who says so? I have two sets. I have two sets. I have two sets. One set with one value, one set with two. And that's my, but that's my constructor. My constructor is accepting two values too and calls that set with two value. OK? So doing that, um, now I, if, I, if I run it, I'm going to have a, And I can have over here three and, uh, three and five. So it's working. You see, it works exactly the same way. Now I'm going to have a container with two. And I'm going to display it right after. So C dot display. And let's put a separator between all these. OK. Now if I run this. This is what happens. So first, creating a container with 200 and 500 value. That's what happens at line six. Then the new line is, uh, the line is printed. It displays the exact same thing, 200, 500. Then it goes to new, uh, draws another line. Then this line of line number 10, as you see, is actually these three lines. First, it creates a com container with three and five. Then it displays it. Then it dies because there is no use for it. Remember, temporary nameless objects are doomed to die when there are no use for it. Compiler immediately removes it from memory. C remains and dies at the end. Now, if I have more than one, and they, re they die in reverse order. It's like you put things, like if you are building something, you always have to go reverse order. That's what happens. So co construct destructors always happen in reverse order. If you have A, B, C, and it's going to be in reverse. So that's that one. 0, 4, multi-arg constructors. Next thing, arrays. How arrays are initialized. This is a question somebody asked in the other class, and I'm mentioning it right here. So when you create an array, if you create an array like this, oh, and one more thing I have to mention. Now let me just do it. So when I create, a, let's say, array of three containers, I just mentioned it like that, OK? To create an array of objects like that, you have to have the fault constructor. 
default constructor is automatically built into your structure or class if you don't mention it. Okay? So if you don't mention any constructors, the default constructor and destructor is automatically built for you. An empty one, that they don't do anything. They don't set anything, they don't do anything. But they are there, so you can actually instantiate your object. Okay? But if you create one constructor, then you are responsible to do the default. I'll show you. So for this one, when I do something like this, and I'm going to say over here, uh, void display containers. And in here, I'm going to pass a pointer. So const container pointer cp. OK? Now I'm going to go int uh, for int i. 0, i less than 3, or size, i plus plus. I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to pass a size 2, int size. Now I'm going to say uh, cpi dot display, and a space in between. And at the end, I'm going to say c out. And out. So this display containers is going to display the containers. Okay? So now I can actually say over here display containers C. And it prints and three, of course. It's gonna print the three containers for me. And there is no there is no uh, rocket science in here. I created three uh, containers. I did not mention anything. And these three containers are uh, defaulted. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So as you see, defaulted container. Def so three containers are built. One by one, they are, all, they, they are printed. And three of them are dead. Simple and straightforward. OK? Now, what I wanted to tell you is this. When you have an array like this, if I had, if I did not have a default constructor, if I did not have a default constructor, so this object doesn't have a default constructor anymore. Because I created the constructor, system will not create one for it. Now, if I come back over here, my code is not compilable anymore. Because when you create an array like that, it has to get defaulted one by one, right? Now, is there a way that I can initialize these two values if I don't have a default constructor? The answer is yes. OK? So um, 0, 5, array. with default constructors. So that's array with default constructors. Now let's bring one. Now, can I? The answer is yes. What you can do is simply put the values in here. So I'm going to say 10, 20, and 30. Or, yeah, 30. So now, because every single one of these is initialized to the value of the container is initialized to this one, C0 will be initialized by 10, C1 will be initialized by 20, and C2 will be initialized by 30. And obviously, they're going to die in reverse order. OK? I'm not calling it. The program is is being called three times because I have three objects created. And as you see, 10, 20, 30 is created. 30, 20, 10 is dying. Always in reverse order. Yes? Not destructor, constructor. But I say, destructor too. But I say, if you create a constructor, any constructor, then the default constructor is not going to get created automatically. You are responsible for it. 
So if you create any constructor, you're responsible for all of them. You cannot say, I'm just going to create the one argument and let the system create the default. It doesn't happen. Then you cannot default your object, as you saw. You cannot have a default, va default uh, you cannot have an object created with no value. Okay? Now, what if I want to initialize the third one to something that has two? Pardon me? No, you can't, you can't do that. All, all you need to do is to put a, a, a nameless object in here. So for the third one, I'm going to say container, say 40 out of 400. So now what happens is this. You cannot do array of arrays because you can't. <laughs> OK? So what happens is that 10 goes to first, 20 goes to second, and this nameless will go. And remember, the nameless, what, one of the things that C++ does is pretty cool. When you create a new object, if it's assigned to a temporary nameless object, it won't bother creating a new object anymore. It simply consumes that as the object that you have. It uses that one and just labels it. So if I say container A is equal to container A whatever, that, uh, that uh, nameless container will be adopted by the name that it's being given. And that's exactly what happens over here. So C2 will be using that nameless as its body, as its thing. So I essentially, it names the third one C2. And it works the exact same way, no difference. So as you see, you have uh, four, 40 out of 400 as the last one that is created. Confusing? Yeah, walk through it. That's the way it is. Nameless objects never get copied. Nameless objects never get copied. That's the rule. Because it's, that's essentially copying, right? That, this is a What? Take, take a look at this. I'm saying container A, 30, or I don't know. 20 out of 40. So I create the container A, correct? Then I say container B equals to A. What happened over here? This is called copying. We're going to learn it later. OK? This is called copying. So essentially, it copies B out of A. Because A already exists and it has identity, it cannot assume its identity. So what happens, it says, OK? Uh, I have an A, I have a B, same thing. I'm going to copy it. It's exactly like an assignment. It copies everything from this one to that one. But if I remove that A and instead I put container 50 and 100, now it says, OK, you want me to create a B out of this nameless? Why am I nuts? I have the nameless. I'm going to name it B. Why do I kill the thing that I already have? I just label it B and I'm done. That's what C++ does. Remember, nameless objects never get copied. Questions? Suggestions? We're going to put all these things to work the next day you're coming in. So the first period of your lab, the next time you're coming in, will be this using dynamic memory allocators. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually build an object called string. So you can use instead of string, C string. It's going to be a class. Its job is going to be actually set up its own stuff. So uh, you're going to see what it is. Any questions? Go. Yeah, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. It, when you want things done to be done at the end. 
If you don't want it, if you don't want anything to be done, you're fine. Why you create it then? You don't need to. But what am I gonna put it? Nothing. If so don't put it. Don't don't create it. That's the point. What do you put it? Like for what? For it structure that the name uh called What 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 what? So you're you're calling it a nameless constructor, right? I'm not calling it. It's being called. And yeah. when it dies, it dies. Does it need a destructor? If you create one, the whatever you put in a destructor will be called. If you don't put it, the it system. Will be destroyed on its own. Yeah, it will be destroyed with a destructor that doesn't have anything in it. That system creates. See, anything that wants to, to die, it needs a destructor. It cannot die without a destructor. So every object has a destructor. Integer has a destructor, double has a destructor. Anything that you see out there, it has a destructor. Okay? But when you create your own custom object, when you create your own compound type, then you have to look. If your compound type is making a mess, you have to have a destructor cleaning the mess after. If your logic doesn't create any mess, then you don't need a destructor. System will create an empty destructor for you. Okay. Of course you do. Okay. Nothing is automatic. The creation of this structure is automatic. What it does is not. So let me again. If I throw up this war, this bottle. If I throw up this throw, throw up throw out this bottle, the water inside will go to garbage. Why? Because it's contained within that container. Okay? So if the class you create holds all these vari all its own variables, you don't need to create a destructor because when it's deallocated, all the guts of it will go away. Okay? Okay? But if they fire me from Seneca, they have to have a destructor for me. Because they have to clean up my table. If they just remove me from Seneca, my coat is going to be there, my desk is going to be there, my computer is going to be there, my bag is going to be there, my stuff in the kitchen is going to be there. I have stuff that are not within me. If you want to remove me, you have to have a constructor for me to remove my belongings with me so no garbage is left. That is dynamic memory allocation, a good example for it. A good example for this dynamic memory. If you do dynamic memory allocation in a class, you need a destructor. Because when the object is gone, initialize. You know, like the, the, the do-it-yourself and stuff that you are creating, you have an initialize over there, right? And then you have a free mem, correct? Right? Go check it out. Get that code of yours, create a constructor, put the initialize function in the constructor. Create a destructor, put the free mem in a destructor. You are home free. You don't need to worry about memory leak anymore. Because when the object is getting created, it gets initialized. When the object is dying, it will call the destructor and free the memory. That's all. So, where is the do it yourself thingy? Uh, let me just, uh, I just want to show you that. It was, uh, it has a source code, right? It, whereas, um, I gave you the source code for it. I only have NLAB here. There you go. So do it yourself, report. I have initialize, I have get marks, I have terminate, correct? Correct. If it was a c object with constructor and destructor, I did not need this. I did not need this. Oh. I did not th need this or this. Because y if you were a good programmer, you would have called the initialize in the constructor, and you would have called terminate in the destructor. 
So essentially, your terminate becomes your destruct. And it cleans up after itself. That's all. Any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Just for fun, go home, create a class that represents a file. You're going to open the file in a constructor. You're going to close the file in a destructor, right? That has no memory allocation. But and again, any time that resources of an object, it's outside of its scope, you need constructor and destructor. Anytime, anything. Say you are writing a communication class that is supposed to get information from network and pass the information to network. When the class gets created, it has to make a connection. When the class is dying, it has to destroy the connection. Anything that is outside, you have to do it. Have yourself a beautiful day.